Okay, welcome everyone to our final just in time math session of the 2020 2021 school year. Um, our focus for this evening is on consolidating. So, what do we do with this last chunk of time to help students to consolidate their understanding in mathematics? To begin, we are going to start with a territorial acknowledgement. Um, in light of what have, has been happening over the past few days, um, I really wrestled with what to do and how to do it. I really wanted to honor the Indigenous voices. I wasn't able to find um, a video clip that got at what I wanted, but I am going to use um, the voice of Eddie Charlie. Eddie Charlie is the fellow that you see sitting there, and I'm going to read his words uh, to begin our session today. My name is Eddie Charlie, and I am a survivor of the Cooper Island Residential School. I was taken away from home at the age of five years old and placed in a residential school, like all the other 150,000 children were. I was hurt really badly as a child growing up in these schools. The amount of sexual and physical abuse that happened to me was frightening. It got so bad, so frequent, that I tried committing suicide while I was in the school. I couldn't handle it anymore. It was getting too much. They were picking kids up off the floor and taking them to a room where they were abused. When I came home, I started fighting with my family. I didn't feel like I had a home. I didn't feel like I was part of my family. I started trying to find ways to deal with the anger and the pain that I felt. I started drinking when I was very, very young and it became my form of self-medication and a coping mechanism that I used for over 30 years of my life. I quit drinking about 25 years ago, and for the first time, I had an opportunity to look at that past that I walked, and I tried to start understanding why I changed and how the effect of residential schools changed my family members and the community people in my community. I look around today, and I see that we have the lowest percentage of graduates of any community and of any cultural background. When you have a 2% success rate of graduates in an indigenous community, that's not good at all. 30 years ago, our, our employment rate was non-existent. Nowhere in our history books is there a written history of what happened to 150,000 children in these schools. These survivors of residential schools are being shamed into silence. If we stop talking about what happened, it will die with the last residential school survivor, and it will be as if residential schools did not happen. I don't want this history to die. I want it to be told over and over and over again until it's impossible that we forget. I don't want to share my story and for people to feel sympathy. I want them to understand too often we tell our stories and people come and provide answers on how we can begin to heal. When people begin to understand, it gives us an opportunity to receive ownership of the path that each one of us walks. I know that true reconciliation will probably never happen in my lifetime or my children's lifetime. But today we are opening that possibility of reconciliation by sharing our stories of the residential school legacies and the history. This story was told by Eddie Charlie in 2019 as part of Orange Shirt Day. And for me, it just feels like I feel so terrible that it has taken the discovery of these 215 bodies for Canada and the world to pay attention, to listen and to believe the stories of the indigenous people. So I wanted to start our session today with this recognition that we're acknowledging not only the land on which we are gathering, but the um, traditional knowledge, the presence, the trauma that today's Indigenous people carry with them, and with the hope that we can begin to understand and give the Indigenous people today and for future generations what um, they deserve, that understanding and that reconciliation. Thanks, Hebron. 
So on our agenda for the rest of our session, we are focused on consolidating student learning and mathematics. We're going to start with uh, Minds On. We'll talk a little bit about how you might do some planning for consolidation. Look at some resources to revisit, review, and re-examine. Look at some other tools and resources for how you might pose some uh, design challenges for your students. And then revisit your role in creating those consolidation opportunities. We'll finish with question and answers. And uh, we will share a resource at the end with links to all of the things that we're talking about in the session today. So let's start with the Minds On. The Minds On is going to come to you from uh, a digital breakout sandbox. Breakout EDU is an organization that's been around for years. Um, and in its inception, it had free resources. It is now, you, you need a paid uh, subscription to access their breakout. However, the digital breakout sandbox is um, a site where teachers create digital breakouts and share them freely with their colleagues. So we're gonna give you an opportunity in breakout rooms to try to solve or break out of this particular breakout called SOAR's Escape. You're gonna have about six minutes and we're not going to tell you anything else, but we want to put you in breakout rooms so that you can collaboratively problem solve and try and find your way out. Okay, Hebron, I'm gonna call on you to get them into groups of three. Welcome back. <laughs> Andrea, it was in order of how many there were, if you want to finish the last question, like one, <laughs> two, three, four color. Oh, oh, you, you already got there. Look at you. That's Science awesome. is delivered, it's submitted. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we're still waiting on one group, but I think we'll go ahead because, um, oh, here they come. Mm -hmm. Sorry, you didn't notice that it ended. Yeah, sure. It's ignore working around the little box right in front of your screen. <laughs> we were all we were all on the Google site Google Sites tab. Oh, fair. Okay. Okay. Fair. Fair. Yeah, we were having too much fun there. Okay, so just a um a comment. I think there needs to be a little sound timer. Ding ding ding. Oh, <laughs> that, good you're right. Google. You know, yeah. actually, our my class has submitted queries to Google numerous times for a ding. They keep uh, asking for a ding. That's what you need, right? Yeah. Yeah, because they're on yeah. other tabs. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. Did okay. anyone get out? Pardon, Emily? I just said, did anyone figure it out? Okay, so hang on. Let's go on to the next slide, Hebron. Yeah. Are you, oh, there it is. Okay. So just to, just as an FYI, we knew we were not giving you very much time. Like kids are gonna need much longer. We did give you an easy one. That's actually a second grade um, breakout. <laughs> the math in it was not at all challenging. However, you do, as Heidi was mentioning earlier, you kind of, people who are familiar with it know what to do. But if you're not, you, you have to figure out like, what do I even do here? And, and intuitively people just start clicking everywhere and that leads you to places. So, we want to just start with an easier one. When you're working with your students, start with an easier one. Even though that's grade two level math, it might be a good task to start with because it's fairly quick to navigate. It's fairly straightforward. There's a couple linked in the document that we're going to share for um, junior that have more junior specific math, but they're also significantly more challenging and will take a good chunk of time. We do, we wanted to model having you work collaboratively, even though you each see only your own screen, unless you were um, presenting something, it still allows you to talk and do that problem solving together. And because you have a limited number of already created breakout tasks, you're not going to be able to specifically identify which math you want to focus on. So the purpose when you're giving this sort of a task is more about that problem solving, reasoning, improving, and communication. So back to Emily's question. Uh, raise your digital hand if you are able to escape in the time allotted. 
So not too many. Again, we did not give you nearly sufficient time. <laughs> right, so other people have escaped other rooms, right. Um, and you want to prepare your students for that because they're not all going to be successful no matter how much time you give them. So you want to talk about the strategies and how did they feel when they got frustrated and what different things did they try and make it a reflective opportunity for your students, not about the escape itself. Um, and talk about those process expectations. So we'll talk a little bit more about how to set up these consolidation opportunities as we move forward. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Heidi. Fantastic, thank you. So when we plan for consolidation, we're taking a look at those key concepts. Um, we're taking a look at representing numbers, uh, algebraic reasoning, operational sense, proportional reasoning, um, operations with fractions, and, and that's something we're going to take a look at as we, we move forward. So the next slide, please. Awesome. So what are we going to consolidate? Well, the key concepts. We're looking at the key concepts that we have, um, we were looking at between second term, and we go back to representing numbers, operational sense, proportional reasoning, and um, using and operating with fractions. And I just repeated myself, didn't I? Well, that's fantastic. So now we heard that twice. So how to support the learning differences. Okay, so we're going to use, we're thinking about the, um, multiple entry points are using the uh, low floor, high ceiling, are presenting tasks, not only orally, but uh, using visuals and in writing, making sure we've touched on all the different learning styles. We want to provide the time and the space for all our learners, and we know that they all learn really differently. Um, making sure we use the virtual concrete tools or manipulatives, and um, keeping in mind all the differences in all our uh, different learners. Thank you. Awesome. So how to, how to maximize the engagement? Well, you have to choose a task. And basically, choosing a task means knowing your students. And we're hoping by at this point in the year that we, we know what our, our, who our students are. We know um, how to engage them, uh, what their interests are, giving them choice, voice and choice, uh, maybe choosing one over the other, um, ensuring that we think about our ELLs and, and our students and IEPs and, and making sure we, we, um, we include all of that in, in the choice. Thank you. Okay. So um, just give me a moment. So yeah, we're good. These are, what we're looking at now are the topics from uh, term two. And we want to make sure that we take a minute and look at the key concepts before we make the choices, before we decide what we're going to um, have our students engage in, participate in. Um, and so this is just a little visual representation of, of where we were and where we are um, at the end of the year for term two. Perfect. OK. So we have another activity for you in breakout rooms. So we're thinking about priming our students. We want to make sure that. We give our students, um, we want to make sure that we give them the information they need before they start a task. And we're taking a look at, right now we have a math up brain bender. And it's called hip hop. Um, it looks, and it says about how many steps um, does a hip hop dancer um, do or, or do in, in two minutes. So what's important about the math task here? We want to make sure we give the students the information beforehand. We want to prime them, but not tell them the answer. And we want to give them a little time to have that math talk and, and think about um, how would they come up with that answer. So are we going to send them into breakout rooms now? Is there anything that I might have not shared, Michelle or Hebron? Please feel free to jump in. OK, so just your task is not necessary to solve this brain bender. Your task is to think, what is the important math in this task for the students that you teach? And then how might you prime your students to be thinking about that important math when you pose this task? So if this is what we want to consolidate, well, what is it that we want to consolidate? What's the key concept? And then how might you help your kids focus on that without telling them to focus on that? So the point of this is to give you a chance to talk to one another and see if you can come up with how you might identify the important uh, math, 
you know, helping your students for that. All right, off you go. Excellent. So I'm wondering maybe we, is there anybody that wants to share out um, a little bit, perhaps something they discussed in their groups or you want to maybe put it in the chat? Um, what were some of your conversations? I talked about like asking students, whoa, is there an echo for anyone else or just me? There's a bit of an echo. Okay, I don't know why, sorry. Um, we talked a little bit about like asking students, um, is there any information missing? What, what would you wish to know? Maybe them saying something like, how many steps can they take in a second or a minute? And then being like, hey, that kind of sounds like a rate or something like that to get them thinking that. Awesome, that's true. And okay. So Minsu, can I ask a question about that? So you said you talked about unit rate and multiplicative thinking. How would you prime students to be thinking multiplicatively or to be thinking about unit rate without saying, hey students, think about unit rate? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I kind of thinking because because it's it's how many steps in one in in two minutes, right? So in order to know how many steps in one minute, you need to know the unit rate first, and then once you have the the the, the steps in one minute, and you can do this one like whether thirty seconds or or one minute or one and a half second and one minute or two minutes, it's like multiplicative thinking. I don't know. I'm not sure if I'm right. No, for sure. We want students to think multiplicatively. I've just, I mean, that was the purpose of this, this um, breakout was to get you to think about if that's the important math, how do we get students to think about it without telling them to think about it? So we heard from Emily where she might ask a, a similar but different question. And Bruce also wrote in there like seconds in a minute, like just to help students get their head around, oh, that's the kind of thinking we're doing without actually telling them, you need to think about unit rate, or you need to think multiplicatively, or you need to think about how many steps a day after takes in one minute, like without telling them an answer. So that was our purpose there. <laughs> oh, Hillary, that's a great idea. Um. I was wondering if you could ask them, does this sound like a, like, does this remind you of a different question? You might say, oh, like when we were doing rates, we did a question like that. Maybe that would connect them. Yeah, for sure. Does this remind you of anything we've done before? Definitely. Well, thank you, everyone. That's fantastic. All right, so we, these are some of the resources to revisit, review, and re-examine. We have the long-range plans um, with additional problems, the math up lessons, cross-strand tasks, the brain vendors, um, a math memory book, maybe collaboratively revisit the math, uh, the key concepts, topics from across the year. Students represent the, their learning in different ways. You have the slide deck, uh, uh, Google presentations, key learnings, um, digital breakouts, um, process. Uh, process expectation focus and um, yeah so thank you it's, I'm gonna pass it on to uh, Hebron you're muted Hebron classic when you're on a different tab <laughs> feel like I've done that for every session this year uh, okay so um, <laughs> we've talked about how you would consolidate um, in terms of uh, some of those specific tasks where you're pulling out specific math. Now we're gonna engage with this idea of a design challenge and also give you some time to, to check out and try some of these tools. So uh, a design challenge um, is, is a creative kind of more inquiry, open-ended um, task where students are using a specific medium or a tool and they're engaging with um, a wide, a broader set of math concepts. But what, what I love about this um, is that, you know, application 
taking a math concept and applying it to a context is uh, one of the best ways to solidify the student's understanding of a, a math concept. So this is what we're aiming to do. So providing rich context and then reinforcing the math concepts and process expectations, which are also in here. So there's two things, two categories here we want you to choose from. Uh, one is Tinkercad. It's uh, basically the same people who do AutoCAD. I don't know if you know. AutoCAD is the, the kind of drafting engineering tool company um, have come up with Tinkercad. And it's geared towards education and students and teachers. So it is a 3D computer-aided design software. Um, it's really cool. There's all kinds of really cool things you can create. Once students have made stuff, they can actually save it and 3D print it, which is like mind blowing because they, they can create something in a software world and make it real. Um, and then the other side is dabbling back into the coding resources that we've engaged in this year. So Scratch, CS First, Code.org um, at home. So what we're going to do now is we're going to give you 10 minutes. So it's 4.35. And in these 10 minutes, we're going to all stay in this room. Um, you're going to pick, choose which direction you want to go, and you're going to try it out. Um, Tinkercad starts you off in a spot where you can create a login as a teacher and then go into uh, lessons or uh, kind of how to use it um, platform. So, um, and then uh, we're going to stay here for your questions. Also, when you discover something really interesting and you want to say, hey, um, this is really cool, I, I would like to use this in this or have an idea, you know, you can unmute and just speak into the Google Meet uh, or type in the chat. So, that is what we're going to do for the next 10 minutes. Just one other note. On the code.org at home link, those of you who have students who are into Minecraft, there is a Minecraft coding thing. Um, that's all I know. I didn't actually explore it in any depth. Um, but if you're interested in that or your students are interested in the Minecraft, Tinkercad's super cool, though. That's what I would do. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm biased, though. E yes. So they're not. Um, it's. Uh, um, Tinkercad doesn't. Uh, you you create student accounts where they don't have to use an email or have any personal information. So that's why they're pretty cool to use. Um, and they don't have to use their Google. You don't. You know the Google login button. They don't have to use that. Um, if you're using a tool that is requiring a Google login, like the, uh, something like that, it is a third-party app, and you will have to get, unless it's like a, a board premium purchased tool, like WeVideo or something. Um, Emily's looking for a PDF of like all the different scratch blocks. The thing is, is that you can mm -hmm. even get more scratch blocks than are there by going to adding. Like you can add color and paint and. Well, I'm not sure there would ever be one that's comprehensive. Mm, that's a good I'm question. just wondering in terms of like, for me, I have like tried to explore, done lots of different tutorials. And then this week we were doing like conditionals and writing a choose your own adventure story and like using the if then else blocks, which I was like very impressed that I taught myself that. And <laughs> then like they get into like different blocks or they want to do a different thing. And I'm just like, uh, I don't know. And then I'm constantly trying to find like a mini tutorial that actually fits. Like I want to be, I want someone to create something where I can be like, I want to use this block and click on it. And it shows me what it's for and what I can use it for. Cause otherwise I'm like spending like two hours trying to teach myself each block. Well, or let the students say, mm -hmm. Hey, good question. Why don't you Google that? Yeah, true. It is. Um, coding does lend itself to to a very different style of um, uh, teaching and learning, um, where the driving force is the student's inquiry process and problem solving. So, um, I think that's. I, I I know that there are some scratch um, platforms where there is many little explainers or little one liners that show you what the blocks are doing. Um, I have to kind of be specific and dig it up. But um, students are able to problem solve with one another. And it's like, you you don't, what we're trying to say, you don't necessarily have to know what each block does, right? Um, 
You just have to have students that when you say, why don't you Google that, they will do that instead of just sit there and stare at you. Yeah. Or, I, or, get, yeah. I get like it's way or, different. Or try it, right? Uh, like coding is one of the, the, the coolest ways to learn because you get instant feedback. It, you get to try it and go, oh, it doesn't do that. That's I didn't think it did that. So I think that's part of also the the platform of learning. It's not. I think we tend to to treat it like an instructional, right? Follow these steps and do these instructions, and you'll get a thing that'll do, do the same exact thing. And that's those tutorials are handy for like getting familiar with things. But in reality, um, coders are always trying things and then going back and changing and trying and changing and trying. So. Um, yeah, I don't know if that's quite an answer. No, that's but okay. It's just like a little tricky because like I'm looking, I'm trying to use coding for like the actual expectations that it's supposed to be used for in the curriculum and like to be able to like use the X and the Y and stuff. Like I'm just finding it really advanced for me and then like to try to get them to do it. I'm a little bit like ah, lost, but I think that might just because I'm trying to jump in at grade six. Right, because they haven't had any, you or them, haven't had any of the pre-learning. Like, coding starts in grade one, and here you are looking at the grade six curriculum. So, yeah, give yourself permission to uh, not have to do that. <laughs> totally. I find the tutorial scratch pieces are, are handy, too. I mean, they're very specific contexts, but you might be able to guess um, ones in which you can apply or make connections to specific math. Um, it does make me wonder a little bit, sorry, this is my last comment, about coding being in the math curriculum versus the science curriculum versus should it almost be in both? Because when it's stuck in math, I really have in my head, I need to use it for math. But in order to teach them the topics, I really need to like use it with just like generic or like they're being creative, creating different things. And it's not, it's in my head, it's I'm like, this isn't math, but it is sort of. So I think what that is, is thinking like just recognizing that coding itself, whether you're coding uh, a song or you're coding for a story to create a story, the coding itself, the logical processes that you use for coding is mathematical. That's yeah. mathematical thinking. And so that's why coding has been added to the math curriculum, not just to keep, you know, we've tried to make connections between coding and like location yeah. movement or coding to, you know, find the area of a rectangle. But you can use coding for anything, and that is math. Like this, you know, a few years ago with the spheros and coding the sphero to just move in different directions. All of that is mathematical thinking. Yeah. It's all in the process expectations. Right? Yes, I went to, um, took my students last Monday through Cobblestone. I don't know, I'd never heard of it before, but a teacher in the school did. Right. And it was awesome. Mm -hmm. They could go into all these different things. And one of them was going in and coding to make the Google um, display move or do things. And the kids loved it and shared. I had no idea what was happening or how to do it. <laughs> but the kids do. The kids do. They're not afraid. They just love it and get excited to share. So sometimes I think, yes, we want to learn it and understand it, but it's okay to have them teach us too. For sure. So that's really good about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, that's a great message, Michelle. And Cobblestone is basically the Google team, yeah. um, like the G Suite team. They just rebranded themselves as Cobblestone. They have great resources because they have people who know a lot. Yeah. yeah. And it was so fun. I had so many kids now that I think want to go work at Google because they <laughs> to at Google and free food and <laughs> a gym. And <laughs> when are we going to have Minecraft education licenses? That's the question that I would like answered. You know, it's interesting, Emily, because we did a bit of exploring of Minecraft and the kids love Minecraft. But in terms of actually applying mathematical 
concepts. Um, even the education in math and Minecraft EDU, it's basically some worksheet kinds of math. Like it's some practice math that they do just to get past something in order to keep building or to get to go somewhere. And there's a lots of like, if you're thinking about it, using it in class, there is tons of wasted time. <laughs> like I was like, pro like I was, prodigy kind of vibes. Oh was, my gosh. No, yeah. I think it took me three days to get everybody signed into um, to the Minecraft. It was like a whole week of prep, just trying to get people into that Minecraft thing. And then they did their Minecraft uh, thing and they were like, Oh, well, yeah, that was fun. Like, I don't think they learned a thing from it. I and was, I think, yeah. yeah, you're right. And I think it's just cause like the, the Minecraft EDU tasks and lessons that are in there are kind of, they weren't made by educators. I would, I'm just going to say maybe. And so it's not utilizing Minecraft's vent well. So then kids walk around and match place value blocks or something. And then they spent another half a half an hour walking around trying to find another one. Right. So the, the time isn't even after you log in. So, um, but I'm not sure. Yeah, there is like, we also have, there's issues with, getting into like the platform the microsoft platform that creates classroom um assignments and stuff yeah i've had issues yes with that. first is I, board approved right like it's like exactly like using any other google application like when you log into cs first right it's supposed to be it is currently not like last week i was able to log in to cs first without a problem and right now i i can't it's saying it doesn't recognize wrdsb at uh, dot ca and I'm not sure why that's happening right now. Oh, I might have to. Put I heard something about them investigating it or checking oh. it out because I know at the beginning we could do it, and I was a little behind doing my coding, and then I couldn't do it, but other teachers were previously allowed to, were able to. Hmm. Could last week. Yeah. I, well, that's yeah. strange. I don't. Yeah. Got to call those uh, consultants. Find out what's to. happening. <laughs> we might have to put a ticket in. We just pass it on to IT. Oh, there, that's, a, that's a good idea. You wouldn't need a third party consent, right? For CS first, the way that you do for Scratch, or you would? Well, even Scratch, um, if you have a teacher version, the, the, the teacher account, your kids can go into Scratch with a code and not their own email. If you yes. want to use their own email, which they can also do, then yes, you need that third party permission. Yeah. But for CS first, they can log in with their school account and it's normal and fine, right? Because it's a Google no. app or no? Theoretically, yes. Today, right now, no. <laughs> okay. Because I have the teacher account for Scratch, but it's like really difficult to use for the kids that have like four or five Scratch accounts because yeah. their account is always defaulting to their Google account because that's what they're signed into Chrome with. But yeah. I've made a new username and password for them. So right. like, I would rather just switch over to CS first because the Scratch teacher account is like, they're doing their whole coding project in the wrong account and then they can't share it. Mm. That's frustrating. Um, I think our 10 minutes is just about up. So uh, hopefully you can hear the sound of my voice and you have had a little bit of time to, to play with Tinkercad and or the coding websites we've listed here. Um, we're going to look at some additional consolidation tools. So again, providing some context here. But here, we're going to look at something that has more of an artistic context for uh, reinforcing consolidating in math concepts and process expectations. So we've got um, tools you might use are Google Draw, which st students would be familiar with. Um, Specifically, we want to introduce you to, and you might already be using these in your class, uh, PixelArt and Pixton EDU. Um, PixelArt is, uh, as it says, pixel-formed uh, art. It's kind of like a really enhanced version of, what was that thing way back in the day we would like use on Microsoft, Michelle? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I forget. Do you remember the little draw thing on Microsoft? Anyway. Uh, anyway, uh, it's like 
it's it's a pixel form of art and it's they can draw they can add layers it's pretty cool um so you might engage in a specific task or an inquiry around that tool um another one is pixton edu which was previ previously uh, bit strips um and that allows you to create uh various uh you know graphic novel style Creations. The, the the thing about Pixton Edu is it it is um, a freemium software. So we did some trial and error and stuff, checking stuff out. And we found that you know you could probably a access 20 20 percent of the the various backgrounds and layers and things that you can use. So create kids can create using Pixton Edu. So it is 4:49. So I'm gonna for the sake of time maybe give you six six ish minutes if that's okay. So we will go till 4.55 and give you a little bit of time to, to check those out. One thing I'm gonna suggest is as you're exploring these contexts, um, I know sometimes we get bogged down in the details of how do I log in, how do I do that? We can problem solve that with you totally. Um, but we'd also, we also want you to think about um, how might this help your students uh, connect, engage, and um, consolidate how might you use this what are some of the context or the tasks or the overarching you know inquiry projects you can connect these to um, and and always this is the time of year we a thing to consider is looking at some cross curricular I know we're just talking about coding and science and uh, math but it gives you an opportunity to think about some of those things where this might fit okay Yeah. I think so, yeah, Emily, yeah. And again, Pixton EDU is like that. You sign up as a teacher, and then you can add your students without their private information. You give them a code. It's actually really fun. Mm. Heidi and I spent a bit of time doing it because it we, was fun. <laughs> we got carried away with like our avatars in our classroom. <laughs> Which your kids would do, but that's OK. That's a you need that, you know precursor before they can actually do something with the tool. I was wondering, cause like sometimes when you sign up, it'll be like this app or whatever wants to be able to access your Google drive. And then there's like the disclaimer, mm. oh, there might be financial records or whatever in your Google drive. And it always makes me nervous, but I'm like, but this is like a website that a lot of teachers use. So I guess it's okay. Yeah. I and used to, uh, sorry, I use a uh, Pixton uh, comic strips for, um, for the kids writing comics about healthy relationships and oh, okay. uh, drug and alcohol, like saying no and, and refusal skills. They like doing that. It it did not take nearly as long to get people on Pixton as it did to get people on Minecraft. <laughs> <laughs> so true. So and just like a bit of a math connection, Heidi mentioned earlier that one of the ways that you can review, re-examine, uh, I forget, I don't know what the other word was, um, but for the math is with a math memory book. And so you could have students create a comic strip recalling or teaching something to someone else um, from their math learning in this term. So a comic strip we don't usually associate with math, but it's what they do within the comic strip that can be the math connection. Um, what, I, what we found, um, beside the math connection with Pixton EDU, that was, um, 
kind of cool was that connection to getting that class photo, you know, and uh, having something that's, uh, you know, doesn't, doesn't, you don't have to worry about privacy, blah, 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 for your end of year stuff, right? So it's kind of cool that if you create a class and your, your, uh, all your students make their avatars and then you, you get to put them in a, you know, a class graduation photo or a class, uh, various class photos. So that was kind of a, a nice, so I put myself on the Pixton diet program. I, uh, I, I significantly changed my body type on Pixton. My student said, I don't think that really looks like you, Mrs. Red. And I said, you oh, know, wow. I told you guys you can look like whatever you wanted. So same goes for me. <laughs> I'm curious which student was brave enough to I'd point that out, right? Oh, uh, they, they <laughs> like to say what they think, so. Oh, that's great. I'd rather them say it than just be thinking it, and <laughs> and I don't know what's happening. So that's true. Is Pixton more like kid friendly than Bitmoji? Because at Grow, we use Bitmoji for literally everything, and the kids always ask about it. But I'm like, no, you're not making your own Bitmojis because there's very inappropriate ones. Yeah, Kid Pixton, yeah, is is designed for kids in classrooms. Okay, there's no like frye jumping out of a wine glass emoji. No. <laughs> also, Bitmoji's tied to Snapchat and social media when they create it, so it, it can yeah be problematic. Aside from all that stuff, but yeah, uh, uh, no, Pixton Edu is standalone. You know, the other thing that I really liked about Pixton, there was an article on CBC Kids News that said. Uh, was a student from Brampton who, who felt he couldn't make his own avatar on Pixton because it didn't have uh, the proper head covering. And then he his teacher had him write to Pixton and Pixton uh, corrected that. Yeah, oh, asked I saw him that. for, that's yeah. Story, that's, yeah. That's awesome. So how, how come at mine, when I'm going in this Pixton, it keeps telling me just to choose a plan that costs money? Hmm. When as a teacher? Are you on Pixton EDU? I, yeah. Yeah, Pixton EDU educator. And did you, what did you click on? I clicked. Sign up free, I'm guessing? Yeah, I think, well, it could, brought me right to the little screens, it looks like. Are you on a, are you on a different platform? I mean, like a, an iPad or? Nope. I'm yeah, on. Do you already have an account? No. Uh, no, I think I created one through the, what did it say? It's not letting me go back any further. So try closing your tab and then opening the link from the Pear Deck again. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I didn't do, I didn't load it from the Pear Deck. Oh, okay. that's probably why. Okay. 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 All right. So we're going to keep, marching on here um one we want to take time to to discuss the teacher's role in cons consolidation of learning um and we've created this little graphic that's hopefully a reminder of uh the process so when what happens when we're engaging students with consolidation slash you know fun inquiry and exciting engaging things it tends to um, have all this potential for rich math and rich learning, but it tends to kind of fly away on us because of various circumstances. And we also tend to say, hey, this is a great thing. They're all engaged. I'm just going to leave them to it. But um, it's actually a great opportunity to do some, some learning. Um, so step one at the top with the little clipboard and the play um, is being purposeful and planning our tasks. So there's tasks that are open-ended that are gonna not necessarily give us a specific type of math, but a wide variety of math, but have some really good teeth for process expectations and consolidating some, some applying some stuff. So um, is that what we wanna do? Or do we want this to be a task that's a bit smaller, that's engaging in a specific type of math, like a brain bender or something from an additional problem task? We're gonna be purposeful and then we're going to prime our students we talked about that how do we get them recalling and connecting to prior learning that they've done in math so that's the little uh person re ready for the race 
And then once the students are primed, we're gonna learn together. So when students are engaged in this experience, which is hopefully gonna be awesome for them, super exciting, we wanna watch, we wanna listen, we wanna ask questions, we wanna observe. This is um, a great opportunity to, to also get a gauge, assess what students are consolidating and how much, how what kind of connections they're making. And then, um, we want to always bring them back and consolidate the math, just like we do with our three-part problems. Um, uh, we want to explicitly identify the key math that was learned through that experience and um, the key math that was reinforced and connect that even further, going back to like the purposeful is connecting it further to prior learning. Um, you know, you might be pulling out if this was, um, uh, if you have digital anchor charts, you might be pulling that out and, and solidifying the connection that way. Um, it, if you were in classroom, which we don't know, um, you might be doing that by pulling out some, some old anchor charts, looking at uh, prior consolidation pieces that you've done together that connect. Um, so this is an important part um, of our consolidation engagement is as teachers, we are all in this process and thinking about this cycle, how we're going to plan, we're going to prime them, we're going to experience something together, we're going to observe them as they experience, and then we're going to consolidate it to the math that they um, have pulled and connected to their prior learning. And then we're going to keep doing that, you know, plan something else and consolidate. So that way, uh, students are having rich experiences, but they're also meaningful and connected to math. <coughs> So that brings us to the closing of our uh, consolidation and engagement session. We would like to ask you, what is something that you anticipate you might use from today's session? Something that you might take, it might be something small, it might be something big that you're gonna explore. If you could pop that into the Pear Deck slide, that would be fantastic. Um, and we are gonna actually stick around after this um, for question and answers, but also to give you a resource um, that puts together on one document um, a bunch of tools, resources, stra uh, strategies that we've, we've collected. So a few of the things we've talked about, but much more um, in this document that'll hopefully be a resource for you going into the end of June. So uh, I'm just gonna wait here for a few of you to pop your responses into this slide, and then we will share that resource with you. And then we will say goodbye to finish off our year, which is kind of crazy. That's super crazy. Isn't it? So this is just you know something that resonated with you. We're not going to check up on you and say, hey, did you use that thing you said you were going to use? We just, <laughs> we just want to know what resonated with you. Today. I am going to hack into your Google Meet. And then <laughs> Pop my head in and just no, I'm not. No. <laughs> that would be cool if you did. Oh, yeah, if I could it figure it out. Wonderful. I guess we're past five already. Hmm. All we'll right. Give another uh, 30 seconds because in 30 seconds when Hebron switches the page you won't be able to give us uh, this feedback about what resonated with you mm -hmm. we want to make sure you have the opportunity awesome that's about 10 9 8 press enter quickly no, I'm just <laughs> I think it, it, it auto saves so don't worry all right thank you Diane so the, the, these are the resources. Uh, the first two are obviously the LRP and the math curriculum. The engagement and consolidation resource page looks like this. I won't, for the sake of time, really go through it um, in detail. But basically, we've got the context, the curriculum connections you might pull from that, the planning considerations, super helpful, things you want to consider when you're planning for that, and then the specific resource. Um, and there's things for math up, there's coding, there's art and visual design, um, there's um, the memory books, a whole bunch of the things we've mentioned, Tinkercad, uh, code.org, all that good stuff. So one other thing, if I if you don't mind, Hebron, I want to mention mm -hmm. under the digital breakout, um, there are four specific breakouts linked because when you go to the sandbox, there are lots of broken links. But if you want to go to the sandbox and check it out yourself, in the um, 
slide deck, which we will share uh, as we usually do the day after the session, there's a link to the actual digital sandbox, or you could Google digital breakout sandbox and you will get that. It's just be prepared for some broken links and mm -hmm. maybe stuff that's not appropriate because it's just a, you know, it's a very public source. So the four that are there, we have vetted, just so you know. Doesn't mean I've solved them though. <laughs> yeah, there's more. All right, and that brings us to the end of our session. Thank you everyone for spending this year with us in yes. GIT. Um, I don't know if this is okay with you, Michelle, for me to allow okay, it. To, sure. to, okay, <laughs> I, yeah, I'm like <laughs> trying to say things with my eyes and she was like, yeah, <laughs> this is also Michelle's last year as consultant and she is retiring. So we are gonna miss, <laughs> she's like, well, she's gonna be having a great time hanging out, doing all kinds of cool things and we're gonna miss her. So um, just wanted to say it's been fantastic learning from Michelle and engaging in some fun conversations and getting really excited about things. So uh, hopefully you guys can, you know, take the next three weeks and send her a little thank you email. <laughs> thank you, Hebron. <laughs> Yeah, do enjoy your last month with your students, however it pans out. Uh, thank you very much for your well wishes. And um, look for that slide deck tomorrow if you do want to access some of these resources again. Um, thank you all so much for the whole year. Mm -hmm. There will be more just-in-time sessions next year um, for math with a slightly different focus, but um, along the same lines. So as each topic, topic occurs, more focus there. So join us again next year. Thank you very much.